We're having you sit for the reading of the word because it's a whole chapter. And uh, would like, as we normally do, if it's long, we want to give you the freedom to go ahead and sit down. Sometimes that helps listen, you listen better, helps me listen better. We're reading from Genesis 4, the whole chapter. This is the word of God. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of, the, of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and uh, we should probably add in the footnote uh, the part that says, let us go out to the field, because that's in the more ancient text, and I think it's probably supposed to be there. Cain spoke to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother and Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And, when the, Lord, and, and the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the, from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wonder on earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have given me today, uh, today away from the ground. You've driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer in the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the name of the city after the, the name of his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad. Irad fathered Mahujael. Mahujael fathered Methushael. Methushael followed Lamech. And Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other, Zillah. Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of those who play the lyre and the pipe. Zillah bore, also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal Cain was Naamah. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. And that time, at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. This is the word of God. May add his blessing to it. Let's pray together. Show us Christ. Show us Christ. Oh God, add your blessing to the preaching of your word. That the name of Christ may be exalted. And everyone confess Jesus as Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the uh, fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith is the doctrine of original sin. And it teaches us that Adam's sin in the Garden of Eden has passed to all of mankind after him so that everyone is sinful by nature. Adam is called the federal head of the human race in that sense. So sin passed to everyone through him. This is corroborated in Romans 5, verse 12 and following. I'll just read verse 12. It says, when Adam sinned, 
sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. At our presbytery meeting this weekend, we examined two men for ordination, and one of them, a, a man named Keith Marriott, was asked uh, uh, about his belief concerning the doctrine of original sin. And he explained it with this illustration. He said, I used to work in a daycare, and one day a three-year-old boy came up to me and gave me the toy that he had in his hand. What a good boy, I said. Then as I watched him, he walked through the, through the group of children, walked up to a little girl, hit her on the head, took her toy, and brought it to me. <laughs> he said, sin is part of our nature. That's the doctrine of original sin. Now, that's a cute story, but the truth behind it is far from cute. No one would call the story of Cain and Abel a cute story. Or if they did, you certainly wouldn't want to turn your back on them, right? Um, recall last week we looked at Genesis 3.15 where God cursed the serpent with these words. He said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring... He shall bruise your head, or he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now the text there says two offspring in the ESV. The literal Hebrew word there is two seeds. Two seeds. So these two seeds would be in a battle with one another, and the, the seed wars would continue through human history. The apex, as we said last week, would come with Jesus Christ who, as the seed of the woman, would defeat the seed of the serpent, Satan, and, and his death by, by Jesus' death and resurrection. And we talked about that last week. Well, Genesis 4 begins the story of these two seeds through two peoples into two kingdoms, the kingdom of the world foreseen by the seed of, of the serpent and the kingdom of God foreseen by the seed of the woman. It begins with the story of Cain and Abel. Through Cain and his progeny, original sin, the original sin of Adam, escalated quickly. Uh, the story talks about their birth of Cain and Abel, and quickly uh, fast forwards to the time when Cain and Abel were young men. Uh, clearly, the point is to show us how quickly the, the original sin escalated to the most heinous of, of actual sins, premeditated murder of a family member. Now, now, Cain murdered his very own brother. In fact, the word brother appears in verses 8 through 11, four verses, six times. The author there is trying to emphasize the fact that if, of just how bad, how awful things have gotten, that this man would murder his very own brother. Cain's murderous jealousy over Abel uh, came because God had rejected Cain's offering and accepted or had regard for Abel's offering. And so the text in verse 5 says that Cain became very angry and his face fell. Now why, uh, although the text doesn't really answer, why was Cain's sacrifice rejected or not regarded and Abel's regarded? It doesn't really tell us, and it's maybe not central to the story, but I think we ought to just think about it for a minute here. It could, because that question has stirred a lot of debate for many centuries with all kinds of explanations, some of them reasonable, some of them not so reasonable. For example, let me give you one that I think is not so reasonable. Some have concluded that this is because God prefers shepherds to gardeners. That, that, I'm not making this up. It's, it's in the commentaries. Uh, but that seems to me very unlikely Mainly because what was the first thing God did after he created man in Genesis 2? He planted a garden. Doesn't sound like he has a bad view of gardeners to me. So I doubt very much that he prefers shepherds over our gardeners. But uh, why, I mean, why did, why did he regard Abel and not Cain? Uh, the most common view among commentators, both ancient and, and modern, is that it's because they approached God with two different kinds of worship, two different hearts. Uh, Cain offered simply, you can see it in Cain's offering, it says he offered, it doesn't say the word simply, but the, the implication is there, he offered simply the produce of the land, which is a legitimate offering, 
but, it, but, it's, but it's not something uh, that he offered at, at any cost. Abel offered the firstborn, the firstborn of his flock. In sincere faith, Abel offered his best, and Cain's offering was just tokenism. It, it, it was done out of religious duty, not out of a genuine faith, not out of a worship from a heart that loves and praises God. Tokenism it brings to mind what God said through uh, the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 29, 13. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. That's Cain's offering. That's what was going I I believe that's what was going on, and, and a lot of the commentaries do as well. You can kind of see it in the description of their offerings. Now, Cain acted out of sheer duty, without the heart. Abel's offering was an expression of his heart for God, his love for God. The, the murderous angle, ang anger of Cain testifies to the fact that his heart wasn't right before God. God looks at the heart. God looks at the heart. Well, toward the end of our passage... Beginning with verse 17, we see Cain's lineage, Cain's progeny. The seventh in line from Adam through Cain is a, is a man named Lamech. Lamech is, Lamech is a, a, a hoss, isn't he? I mean, he is a mess. The, the, the number seven is significant there. He's the seventh in line from Adam, and it shows this completeness. What completeness? The completeness of the escalation of original sin to this full-blown evil man, Lamech. And the narrator slows the story down there after, in verse 17 and, and inserts a poem, a poem about what Lamech has done and show, to show the gravity of Lamech's sin, sinfulness and evil. We see in it pride. We see in it bigamy. We see in it murderous vengefulness. Because of the sin of Adam and Eve, the seed of the serpent represented by Cain's lineage has tumbled quickly into utter darkness and evil and self-absorption. Contrast that with Abel. Now, it's not that, that original sin doesn't affect Abel. Original sin affects everyone, right? We've already said that. But Abel's line, the seed of the woman, is a righteous line. In fact, we go to Hebrews 11, verse 4, and it looks back and comments on Abe, Cain and Abel, and it says this, By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. Through which Abel was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gift. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. John would pick up the same idea in 1 John chapter 3, verse 12, where he says, We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. So Abel was the righteous one. John followed that up in verse 13 to something that alludes to this idea of these seed wars that we're talking about, the battle between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. In verse 13 of 1 John 3, he says, Do not be surprised then, brothers and sisters, that the world hates you. Seed wars. The action of our story, and it's a story, and it's a well-written story, it intensifies. It, 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 the crisis comes with Abel's murder. It's just like we begin to stop. We, we stop and say, oh, no. Has the righteous line been ended? Is that the end? Is, is, is it the seed of the serpent from here on out? Did the serpent win after all? And then the story continues, and we find out, no, thankfully. Though Abel has been killed, Eve gives birth to Seth. To Seth, and the, light, the righteous line, the seed of the woman, is opened back up again. Look at, uh, again at verses 25 and 26 of Genesis 4. It says, Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called him Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me an offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also was born 
uh, a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. And here it is. And that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. So all hope is not dashed. There is hope. The line of the seed of the woman is, is, has been rescued by God. Let's jump ahead to the New Testament. And we see in Luke chapter 3 where Luke gives us a genealogy of Jesus Christ. He, he traces Jesus' genealogy back to Seth. Actually back to Adam, but through Seth. So the line, the seed of the woman, the line of Seth, is the line of Jesus Christ, the righteous one. You see, like I said before, the whole Bible is a meta narrative. It's a grand story with a whole bunch of little stories of real people with real histories that comes together as one big story of God's redemption of a people for himself. It's a great story. So we have these seed wars, and, and they go through time. They're between these two kingdoms, the kingdom of the world ruled by Satan and the kingdom uh, of God. It all starts with the sin of, sin of Adam and Eve, and it passes on through their sons to everyone. So the stage is set then with Cain and Abel for the story of redemption to continue on. The seed wars between the faithless, self-reliant, anti-God world system arraying itself against the true worshipers of of God. Who will win? Who's going to win in the end? What is going to become of it all? It starts out treacherously. But Jesus would say in Matthew 16, verse 18, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Church, remind yourself that this is a war. I mean, don't obsess about that, but be aware that there are worldly systems of godlessness that influence you. There are passions of the flesh that are not just passive, but they're actively trying to take you down for your faith. There's also the devil and his demons. These all wage war against our souls, and we're to resist them. Not in our own strength, but standing firm in our faith in the Lord. Well, Jesus would tell a parable about the seed wars, uh, which in, in, in this parable he st distinguishes between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, although he doesn't use those metaphorical terms. Instead, he uses one that you know, the wheat and the weeds, or the wheat and the tares, depending on which uh, version you're using, it points to the ultimate victory of, uh, of, of the seed of the woman over the evil one. It points to the VE day for the righteous line, the victory over evil for the righteous line. Look at Matthew 13. You've got your Bible, turn there. We'll look at this parable for a moment. I'm going to start in verse 24 and go to verse 30, and then I'll pick up at 36 and go to 43. Matthew 13, beginning in verse 24. All right. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in the field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No. Lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow until the harvest, and at the harvest, at the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first, and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. And then picking up at verse 36, it says, Then he left the crowds and 
went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, and here it is, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed is, is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. So you see the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. The weeds are the son of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest, the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of the kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. What did the story of Cain and Abel and the parable of the wheat and weeds tell us? Well, first of all, they tell us that God will see that his people win the victory. The faithful might be knocked down. They might be taken captive. They might fall at times, but they might be wounded, they might suffer, they might even die, but they won't be knocked out, they won't be lost, ever. God will keep his promise to bring all of his people home. And secondly, it tells us that until Christ returns, we live in a world where the seed of the serpent, or the weeds, and the seed of the woman, or the wheat, dwell together. They are mixed together. Our efforts to, to, to be aware of that and to be guarded against the temptations that might arise because the weeds and the wheat are dwell, dwelling together and there's influence happening. Our efforts to seek to uh, stand firm against those temptations, those are, that's, that's warranted and it's wise. But to suppose that we can produce some sort of uh, 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 Christian walled city, some sort of righteous utopia of Christ, a Christian bubble in the world is a fool's errand. We can't do it. We can and should guard our hearts and nurture our heart for God through the means of grace that he gives us and he set before us. But we'll always live among God's enemies until the consummation when Jesus returns to make all things new. So our efforts to create little Christian bubbles where we throw out all the weeds, it's just not going to work. We've got to figure out how to navigate this field with both there. Genesis 4 would have been comfort to the original audience who was Israel, as we said before, after leaving Egypt. Uh, Egypt's, Egyptians uh, had already been hot on their tail. They've got other nations that are coming against them that they're afraid of. Uh, it would have been a comfort to them for God to say, I will have a people. I will have a seed that I will keep no matter what happens. And today, many people fear the demise of the church. They fear that our children's children and their generation will lose faith. But Jesus sustains his church, and that's what these words are encouraging us. That, that's the hope we find in the story of the seed wars. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman, the son of Seth, is, ushers us into this kingdom of God. It ushers uh, and assures us of eternal life and, and, and assures us of strength for the journey until the day he comes. So the question is, what ultimately do we have to fear? Well, let me go another direction with this. How do we know then who is the seed of the serpent or a, a weed and who is the seed of the woman or wheat? And the answer is we don't. We can't judge that ultimately. We can, we can look at the sinful lives of others and, our, and even ourselves and, and say, okay, uh, there may be something that hints one way or the other. If there's no repentance, that would be an indication that maybe that's someone in the, weed, in the weed camp, but we need to remember one thing. All of us were weeds. All of us were the seed of the serpent camp at one time. 
God rescued us out of it and ushered us when he gave us by grace faith in his son Jesus Christ and through that faith brought us into this, 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 uh, this new kingdom, this new citizenship. So we don't pass ultimate judgment on anyone. We assume anyone is, is potentially God's elect. Saved, to be saved, waiting to be saved. The, bring the gospel to them. Pray for their souls. Get to know them. Unless their influence is too much on you. Then I would say, yeah, you probably have good reason to stay back. But if not, get to know them. Love them well. Befriend them well. Pray for opportunities, for open doors for the gospel. Well, one final thought on this text Uh, God said to Cain in verse 7, If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. So what's going on there? Sin is personified. The actual word uh, is very similar to an Akkadian word that means a demon. Sin is is, is given personality, and it's crouching, waiting to to take Cain's heart, which in a verse later, it does. It's crouching in his doorstep. It's like a lion. Even though this is spoken to Cain, it's a universal truth. It was true for Abel, for Seth, and for everyone thereafter. Sin is crouching at the door of and its desire is for you. Look at what Peter said in 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9, and see if this doesn't sound a lot like what was said in Genesis. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, crouching at the door. Resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. If you live in the awareness of evil without obsessing over it, you will be sober-minded. You will be wise. And to help you along the way, remember this promise that we hear in 1 John verse 4, 4. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than than he who is in the world. That ought to give you a sense of strength. That ought to give you hope in the midst of a powerful enemy, that the one in you through faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit in you is greater than your enemy. Well, finally, uh, Gordon Wenham, who has a great commentary on Genesis. If you want a great, if you wanted to do one commentary I think I would re- recommend this one, except that it's got some of the stuffs in Hebrew, and you, you have to, but you can get through it anyway. Um, it's so good. Uh, and he says this, something extraordinary uh, about the last verse. He says, the last verse of chapter 4 says this, at that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. And listen to what he says about this. That contains the 70th mention of the deity. That word Lord there is the 70th mention of the deity of God in Genesis. And it's the 14th time that the word call is used. Now, we said already in this sermon, and I've mentioned before, the number seven is significant to these ancient texts. The 70th use of the word God is, is, is something that we go, oh, this is very important. This is so significant. What does he say there? What is that 70th thing about the Lord? It says this. What's the point? Worship the Lord. Worship the Lord. Trust him. Call on his name. Very emphatic in the Hebrew because it's the 70th time. I hope you're here this morning for that reason above all others. He who loves you, he who saves you, is worthy of all your trust, all my trust, all of our devotion. And he will sustain us in the midst of the seed wars. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, 
the ultimate seed of the woman through whom we know salvation, through whom we know victory. We pray that you would give us strength in the battle because it's even now, perhaps, but certainly as soon as we leave this place, the world, the flesh, and the devil are going to get to work, and they're strong. And so, Jesus, we look to you. We want to worship you well. So we ask, we, we come before you as Abel did in our own weakness, saying, we trust you. We surrender to you. Be our strength. Father, we pray that if there's any here who are still in the camp of the seed of the serpent and not the seed of the woman through Jesus Christ, we pray that these words would bring them to a place of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, that they might know salvation and follow you, Lord Jesus, from now and forevermore. It's in your name we pray. Amen.